beloved of Yeshua, this is Randy Kay, and I have a question for you. What do you think is the greatest roadblock to experiencing the fullness of your relationship with God? There's a clear answer for this, and I'm going to give you just a moment to think about that, because once you overcome this one thing, then your relationship with God will rise exponentially and you will be graced with an intimacy with God that you never had before. So what is that one thing? It is fear. Fear is the greatest roadblock to your relationship with God. Now, today we have all kinds of reasons to fear, don't we? We have had the fear of COVID, which has inspired a fear of death and sickness. We have the fear of war and rumors of war and the potential for nuclear warfare. We have the fear of being destitute, that is, of not being able to afford the essentials in life. We have all kinds of fears circling in this world that enter into our thinking process. And those fears tend to divorce us from our relationship with God. But there's a solution for overcoming those fears. And it is, quite honestly, frankly, knowing and trusting God. Because, you know, fear impedes our faith foremost. What's the difference between fear and faith? Well, fear paralyzes us, but faith empowers us. You know, the Bible in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, when Paul said that to Timothy, he knew that Timothy struggled with as a, as a timid person. Timothy was young and he was learning and he needed to be encouraged to be bold in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That wasn't uh, Timothy's nature. He wasn't bold and he was very fearful. And so Paul encouraged him that he needed to be strong and trust in God. You know, we've had a number of afterlife experiences on this show. And they have emboldened faith like nothing I have ever witnessed in my lifetime. And others have said the same thing. And that is hearing of those like me and others that uh, we've interviewed who have met God, met Jesus face to face, been in heaven and the afterlife after dying, well, we testify that indeed there is life after this life. The fear of death has been ranked the number one fear of all. Some might even go as far as saying the fear of death is actually the most underlying fear that creates the fear of everything. Because if we fear death, then we fear sickness that can lead to death. We fear the loss of our securities financially and health-wise and otherwise that we rely upon in this world, which ultimately leads to a fear of death. The fear of death underlies most of our fears, but it's not the only fear, because fear often equates to worrying. You know, afterlife experiences do eliminate the fear of death and fear because they testify of life eternal and the end of suffering for all who are in Christ Jesus. The fear of suffering, of pain, 
of living in a perpetual state of worrisome creates a life that is sometimes almost not worth living. And I've heard from many of you who are going through great suffering today, but testifying of heaven, testifying of a heaven where there are no fears, no suffering of any kind, no tears of sorrow, only joy, gives us a promise and a hope. But there's a great work to do in this world, and we cannot do it if we are fearful. You know, each of those of us who have died went through some form of fear. Mine was suffocation. I was fearful. I was fearful at the point of death. I was fearful of my family not being able to live as we were fashioned or or as we were accustomed to living, that they would go through all kinds of suffering as a result of my not being there to provide for them and to protect them. I had all kinds of fears going into my afterlife experience, but all of those fears were assuaged. That is, they were eliminated by the fact that is the very fact that I was with God after dying. There's an after dying experiences experience that each of us will have that will allay our fears once and for all. But, you know, now we face fears. You're going through these experiences that we've told you about in heaven vicariously. And the confidence of your immortality in Christ has been strengthened and established through them. But fear serves to dispel that confidence. If we don't live in a disciplined way to alleviate or eliminate fear, then we will fall into the trap of fear. And that's a physiological trap as well as a spiritual trap. Dr. Gregory Burns of Emory University is a neuroscientist. He studies the human brain and how it reacts to certain situations. In 2008, he was studying how the human mind reacts to fear. In an article for the New York Times, Dr. Burns said, and I quote, The most concrete thing that neuroscience tells us is that when the fear system of the brain is active, exploratory activity and risk-taking are turned off. Risk-taking. You know, if we have a lot of fear consuming us, we don't take take risk. A risk is really a a step of faith. God asks us, like in the case of Paul teaching Timothy, that we need to take a risk, that we need to stretch our boundaries. We need to push our boundaries sometimes to the limit. Following God can be risky, can't it? You know, Noah took a risk when he built an ark. Taking risk helps eliminate fear. Taking a risk is actually the antidote to fear. You know, Abraham took a risk when he left the land of his forefathers. He was in the security of being with the Jewish people, and he was considered as the forefather of Judaism. Moses also took a risk when rescuing his people from Egypt. Joshua took a risk when he marched around Jericho, when the walls fell after he had circled it several times. Gideon took a risk leading 300 men against an army of thousands. And then God dwindled down his army in the face of an overwhelming force. But Gideon was 
respectful and obedient to God. And he became the victor as a result of listening to God. Of course, we all know the story of David and Goliath. The giant, Goliath, had been taunting the Israelites and the army of Israel day and night for 40 days. Paralyzed by fear, the king and his men didn't know what they were going to do. And that's when David stepped in. Just a a meager shepherd boy, David was filled with faith. He had little or no fear, and his faith empowered him to defeat a giant. You know, today, many people in the world are facing a greater fear than they have ever felt in their lifetime. Maybe that's you. Crises of all kinds and abundant misinformation in the world is embedded within our mindset thoughts of being of fear being fearful the news oh my goodness the news it's taking our sanity on a never ending roller coaster ride one day it can seem like we face the worst of it and then the next day something else happens and it just feeds into what our world has become as a result of that fear being imputed to us. Our world has never felt less peace-filled and more fear-filled. You know, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, God says to fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. My righteous right hand. I find that very interesting because when I first met Jesus, it was the the right hand of Jesus that held on to me. The first words out of his mouth to me as he whispered into my ear were, trust me. Trust in God eliminates fear. You know, but fear in and of itself creates roadblocks in our life. You know, Genesis uh, chapter 15, verse 2 says, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless? And that's a reference to Abraham. Abraham was an old man. And God told him that he would have a child. And Abraham, of course, felt that, well, you know, how can I have a child? I'm, I'm an old man. The first time God, God's commandment was, do not be afraid, is recorded actually in the Bible when he was talking to Abraham. Abraham obeyed God by leaving his home and traveling to an unknown land. As Abraham settled in the area, he faced difficulties with the Pharaoh of Egypt and his nephew Lot and the king of Sodom. Each time, God brought him through with abundant blessings. While Abraham was, could have felt fear in all of this, God only addresses his fear when Abraham questions the fulfillment of a covenant that God made with him. You know, God promises that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. That was the promise he gave to Abraham. But Abraham doubted that promise. And God has made us numerous numerous promises that perhaps we've forgotten. 
Now, this seemed to Abraham at the time impossible since, again, Abraham and his wife, who was also elderly, were without any children and were well past their childbearing years. Abraham's fear created an obstacle to believing in God's promise. God's promises throughout the Bible are just absolutely abundant. And he's made them for you and for me. My question is, are you allowing your fear to create an obstacle to believing God's promises for you? God promises never to leave or abandon you. He said it in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. God says he knows the plans he has for you, plans for your well-being, not for disaster. And that's recorded in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. My friends, do not allow whatever fear you are experiencing to create a roadblock to believing God and the promise that he has given to you. He is greater than any fear you will face. And you will know that in heaven fully, but in this world, we need to trust God. Secondly, about fear is that it makes us lose our focus. And in this world, so many, most of us, I would guess, have lost our focus. That's why we worry. That's why we fear. We're putting the cares of this world ahead of the cares of God. Our attention is focused on what is around us or circling in our mind versus what is of God and his promises to us. It says in Genesis chapter 7, verse 5, and Noah did everything the Lord commanded him. Now, the story of Noah relates closely to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. His family was forced into social isolation for 40 days. Now, that's not even the most fear-inducing element of that story with Noah. While his family was in quarantine on a massive boat, God destroyed everything outside of the walls except for the animals Noah had taken upon the boat. Now, it would rain for 40 days. Now, in that time of Noah, in the history analogs, there had never been rain. It had never happened on the earth before to this point. Rain was a foreign concept to the people of that time as water had only come from the ground, not the sky. But despite all the unknown circumstances, the word fear is never mentioned in the Bible with reference to Noah. God knew that Noah was not a fearful person. God didn't even tell Noah, quote, don't be afraid. He never told Noah, don't be afraid, as he does other people in the Bible. We do know that, uh, that Noah found favor with the Lord because he walked with God and did everything the Lord commanded and was righteous before God because he trusted God and he trusted God's promises. For those of us who trust God, we will not be fearful and therefore we can do the very thing that God has called us to do. You know, while Noah Uh, most likely was afraid, you know, he was human like any human would be, he didn't allow it to be his focus. Noah's focus remained on God so that he could be obedient to God's call 
on his life. God is calling for you, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, you've lost your focus on that calling. Maybe it's because of fear. And I would say that probably it is because of fear. But God's promises overcome all fear. The second thing that fear does is it makes us forget God's truth. You know, in Matthew, uh, the book of Matthew, that is, chapter 28, verses 5 through 6, it says, the angel told the women, and that is the, the women that, uh, that were around Jesus when he was being crucified, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. They were at the tomb and the tomb was empty. The angel said, for he has risen just as he said. Now, Jesus told them that he would rise on the third day. They had that promise, that word from God. And instead of trusting him, the people of that day, well, they didn't believe. They thought his body had been robbed of, it, of the tomb, from the tomb. Now, after Jesus was arrested, the disciples scattered and hid in fear for their own lives. They didn't believe either. They had seen miracles galore. They had been with Jesus, and they still were fearful. Fearful not of God, fearful of the Pharisees and the Romans. Now, only the women and John remained at the foot of the cross when he was being crucified, and on the third day after he was laid in the tomb, the women that were there continued their service to their rabbi by preparing his body with oils. And the women were afraid when the earth shook and an angel appeared. The angel reminded the women that Jesus had risen, just as he said. And in the time leading up to his death, Jesus told his followers multiple times, that he would rise on the third day. The disciples' fear caused them to stay hidden instead of walking to the tomb with the women. Jesus had prepared them all for this moment, and yet their fear made them forget his words. Oh my goodness, beloved of the Lord, is that not the case for us today? Are we not that dissimilar than the disciples in the time of Christ that we have forgotten the words that Jesus has spoken to us in these end times that he will return and he will claim his own and that he will redeem that which was lost for good and that, yes, he will pour out judgment, but it will only be to those who have rejected him, not you, as, as a child of God, as a child of Jesus. And if you're not, you need to pray to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that you will have that confidence as well. Now, God's truth can be forgotten when you, beloved of the Lord, allow your fear to cloud his words. Challenges of life can create fear and makes us not remember the truth he has spoken into our lives. The moments when God said, yes, make you wonder, don't they, if you really heard him correctly, when a situation becomes difficult and fear takes over. You know, when uh, I was in that situation, I knew God's promise. I had read the Bible. I, I knew that God had promised heaven after, after death. I knew his promises. And yet, I had forgotten them at the point of death. You know, the gift of God's peace is tested when circumstances fill 
fill us with fear. That's really when push comes to shove. And we know that we have really believed that we have faith that God is who he said he is and that he will do what he said he will do. I was a very fearful person before going to heaven. You know, in heaven, fear is non-existent because trust in God is absolute. There is no sadness in heaven. Joy is the ethos of heaven. Everyone is joyful and no one is sorrowful in any way, shape, or form. The first two words that Jesus spoke to me in heaven were, trust me. Fear, often the fear of God's judgment, keeps us from trusting in God. You know, I've told this story before, but perhaps you've not heard it. After I was in heaven, I saw a series of vignettes, life reviews, as they're oftentimes called. Several others with whom we've interviewed have stated the same. And in my case, I had expected that I would be condemned for my failures. I really believe that. And yes, I was covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. However, I still had that fear going into this situation before I entered into heaven. But here's the surprising thing. When God showed me the times that I had failed him, they did not serve to condemn me. They only reflected the grace of Jesus in all of these things. You see, because I had been judged as a believer in Jesus and found not guilty, that is, I had been looked at as guiltless, that is, flawless in God's sight, not because I was flawless, not because I was guilt-free. It was because I had asked forgiveness of Jesus for my sins so that I was washed new. And when I returned to this world, I remembered vividly every facet of heaven. I could tell you the colors, shapes, sizes, smells, and every detail except for those times when I had failed Jesus. And later I had prayed, Lord, what was that about? I can remember every life review. I could remember every, every facet of heaven. I could remember every conversation that I had with Jesus and the glory of God on the throne, but I cannot remember my own failures. And he answered this way. He said, because I have removed them as far as the east is from the west. You know, God said that in the Bible. You know, if he said north and south, there's an end to north and south, but there's never an end to east and west. It is never ending. It is constantly, constantly going to an unending, revolving nature, such that it never, never ends. As far as the east is from the west, says that God has forgotten the sins that we have repented of. God doesn't want to judge you, beloved. He wants to forgive you. And that's what I understood in heaven. Perhaps uh, one of the most certainly profound understandings that, that I gleaned from heaven is that Jesus wanted to forgive me more than I wanted to forgive myself. Many think of God as being angry at them, as wanting to judge us, to basically condemn us. And that's clearly not the case. Now, that doesn't absolve us from the need to repent before God. But if repentance is out of fear of God, and I'll talk shortly about the fear of God, and how that may be different than what you may think about it. But if our, if we fear that God is going to condemn us, 
then we miss the mark that he loves us so much that we should not want to offend him. That should be the motivation for wanting to live according to what God has established for us in the way that he has established us to live a job that is pleasing unto the Lord and to seek forgiveness, repent of our, of our failures, our sins. It should be because we would not want to offend the one who loves us most. Because when you see him face to face, oh my, you will know that God wanted to forgive you more than you even wanted to forgive yourself. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says this, Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced is perfect love. You know, if you fear God more than you fear this world, or if you fear this world as much as you fear God, then <laughs> two things have happened. Either you've prioritized this world over God, or you don't understand God's love. We should not fear God's judgment. We must only surrender, beloved of the Lord, to his authority. You know, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23 says this, and I'm going to be reading from the King James Version here. The fear that is, in parentheses, I say awe, because that's very accurately interpreted as awe, in the Greek word uh, translation, the fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. I learned in heaven that God wanted to forgive everyone who appeared before him. It's just that those who are not cloaked in the righteousness of Jesus could not look upon that righteousness and not feel condemned. If you're feeling condemned, then you do need to either get on your knees or speak to him right now and ask him to search your heart and then to just seek out the ways that maybe you have offended God or fallen short of what God wanted you to do so that you can ask him to forgive you and he will forgive you. It doesn't mean that if you haven't done that for every little thing that you've done badly, that you're going to be condemned in heaven. No, no. Think of the thief on the cross who is next to Jesus. That thief had done a lot of bad things. But because he acknowledged Jesus as his Lord and Savior, as the true Messiah, it's because of that that Jesus said today he would see him in paradise, that is heaven. The thief didn't have time to repent of every sin at that time, I'm guessing, that he had committed, but it was implied that he saw his unworthiness is unworthiness. And that's a that's a healthy, a healthy feeling. Unworthiness in terms of low self-esteem is, is a different issue. Because God found us worthy enough of himself that he would be crucified on the cross. If you don't feel you're worthy of Christ, know this that Christ found you worthy of himself. That being said, the thief found him unworthy of heaven. But by, can, by acknowledging Jesus as his Lord, Jesus found him worthy of heaven because of the thief's confession 
of Jesus as God. I learned in heaven that God wanted to forgive me. And he wants to forgive you. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It says in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9, verse 10. It says here specifically, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Healthy fear is trusting in the awesomeness of God such that all fear apart from God can be dispelled. So that's the healthy form of fear. And fear of the Lord is not a fear of condemnation. It is more, as I learned in heaven, the awe. And that awe is not just because of the magnitude, the almightiness and glory of God. It is because that awe that he loves us so very much. For those who have read my book, Revelations from Heaven, I'm going to ask you a question. What was the first revelation that I discussed in that book? Well, for those of you who may not have read it or remember it, it was this. Jesus sees you as though you were the only person in the world. Did you know that? Did you know that he looks at you as he did at me in heaven? as though I was the only one that mattered. He looks at you as though you are the only one that matters in the world. Now, of course, everyone matters to God. But there is a total devotion of how God views you. He is totally devoted to you, such that all the cares of the world are as nothing in comparison to his care for you. That's how God sees you. It's how he loves you. It's how you will see him in heaven fully. But for now, you need to trust in that. You see, once you grasp on to the absolute love and devotion of God for you, that will dispel all fear. Because the fear of this world serves to distract us, it serves to prevent us from taking the risk we need to take in order to fulfill what God intends for us. It tends to focus us on the ways of this world versus the ways of God. Fear tends to immerse us in our suffering. And there will be no end to that suffering when indeed God has promised an end to all suffering and I can testify that there is a point at which there will be no suffering. Today, today, my beloved friends, uh, I do suffer at times. I'll be quite honest with you, uh, and I'm not saying this in a boastful way at all, that uh, I am on the precipice at times of uh, being in the hospital from some lung infection or some malady of, of clotting in my bloodstream or what have you. But I don't have fear. I really don't. I remember most recently being in the hospital and doctor came in and he showed me the, the scan, the image from the CT scan. And, and uh, you know, he was showing me these dark spots and, you know, maybe cancer, blood clotting again, pneumonia, mold on both lungs, you know, well, I thought, well, you know, is this it, Lord? You know, is this is this uh, the uh, next time I will be in heaven uh, forever and ever with you? And uh, the Lord said, ah, of course, because I'm speaking with you today. No, no, but I have a friend. His name is Gene, who just yesterday shared with me that he was diagnosed with stomach cancer. And his diagnosis hit me harder than when I had been in the hospital uh, suffering in that precipice because it is the suffering of others that is more hurtful, perhaps, certainly has been for me, 
than my own suffering, and maybe you've experienced that as well. I've realized that those who have suffered the most are those who are the most tender-hearted to those who are going through their own suffering. And if you're going through suffering today of any kind, of fear, of, of uncertainty, just know this, that your suffering is due to one of two reasons. One is a lack of trust in God, or, and perhaps as well, it is because there is a, a means that of that suffering that will bring you to a greater ministry to others, a greater kingdom purpose than you have ever had before. There is no one that can minister more profoundly than the one who is going through suffering and has a tenderness of heart to declare God's righteousness and God's promises because suffering oftentimes can lead us to a point of fear. But suffering can also lead us, if we draw closer to God, to a point of actual thanksgiving because we have the hope of heaven, the hope of an eternity forever and ever with Jesus. Beloved the Lord, if you are a believer in Jesus and if you have confessed your sins and asked him to become Lord of your life and to direct your steps, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Until next time, be blessed. See you next time.